some of the imaging that she does. I appreciate that. Thank you, Susan. And so today uh, we get to, and, and Susan, you go by Susan and not Sue, is that correct? I do, yes. Yes. So this is Susan Pasquitz. I'm going to ask you the five questions that I ask everybody. There are five questions are, where were you born? Where'd you go to high school? Where'd you go to college? What'd you study? Where'd you go for advanced degrees? What'd you study? And when'd you come to UW-Madison? If you choose not to answer any of those, that's fine. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Where, I know it's grillage. <laughs> Where were you born? I was born in Bangor, Maine. <sighs> yeah. And then my dad was a Methodist minister. So we moved from there to Michigan and then to Illinois. And most of my life was in Illinois. All so, over. We moved every couple of years. Paul Kelleher, who gave the talk at Wednesday Night Lab last week, is from Bangor. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. You Bangorites should get together and have a. Yeah, we could, could yeah. have a party and reminisce. <laughs> yeah. So, and then where did you go to high school? I went to a couple of high schools in small towns in central Illinois. So one was in a little town called Alexis and the other was in a little town called Greenfield. Wow. I'm from Illinois. I've never heard of either one of those. Right. And they were small indeed. Wow. And where'd you go for your undergrad? I went to Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. And you studied? Zoology, but uh, really with a... a entomology focus. Very nice. And where'd you go for your graduate work? Uh, well, I did my PhD at the University of Georgia in the Department of Entomology there. SIU just had a zoology department but with a good. very good entomologist on staff. Good. And then uh, what brought you to Madison? What year did you come to Madison? Yeah, so I worked at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta for about three years. And uh, during that time, I was looking for a faculty position so I could do research uh, as a scientist on staff here and got offered the job uh, in 1990 and then moved here in 91. Very good. So you're a medical entomologist. Is that fair enough from way yeah. back? Yeah, that's right. Did you do your PhD work in medical stuff or was that a... Yes, I did. I did. I started with a, just a general interest in insects and fascination with the, uh, the, the micro world around us uh, and then realized, you know, um, I had intended originally to, to go to medical school and then realized that I probably didn't want to take that track because I didn't, I thought it would be really difficult to work with sick and cranky people all the time. <laughs> Uh, and so you so became a faculty member? <laughs> 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 well, I didn't know that then, <laughs> Tom. <laughs> but anyway, I um, uh, had had this great class when I was in high school with a biology teacher who had us uh, yeah. making an insect collection. So I got interested in insects and then, you know, kind of melded those two, two things into the medical entomology um, uh, pursuit because so many insects are involved in transmitting yeah. diseases to people. And so my graduate work was really on malaria and malaria transmission and trying to prevent that with some novel strategies. Very good. What well, can you tell us about the new uh, insect research collection, uh, the new space for it uh, in entomology? You know anything about that? Well, um, I mean, we have a wonderful uh, Wisconsin insect research collection that has about 3 million specimens in it and it's housed in Russell Labs on the third floor. And they have um, some additional space actually across the way in the stock pavilion. I uh, know right. about space over there where they have like the lepidopter and the butterflies yeah. and moths, you know, are housed and they're getting yeah. that fixed up. Okay, they got some good. great um, resources, some money from campus actually to help with that renovation. So I was, I follow their Twitter feed and I was looking at their new pictures, the pictures of their new space. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, really proud they're, of them. They're keeping the lepidoprins away from the coleoprins. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So today you're going to get to talk with us about your work with the Center on Vector-Borne Diseases, the Midwest Center for Excellence in Vector-Borne Diseases, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate this. Um, this will be the first of two talks this spring. PJ Leash is going to be talking to us mm -hmm. in a couple of weeks. So this will be really good to hear what you have to say. I appreciate it. Thanks again for coming to Plato Frontiers in Life Science. Yeah, thanks, Tom, very much for inviting me. It's always fun to give these talks because it makes me go back and kind of look at, you know, what do I need to update in, in my presentation? And I realized today I had a lot of things that we've been doing over the last year or two that I haven't really talked to people about much yet. So 
I'm going to share my screen so you can see some slides that I put together for you. So let's see. That works. We'll do that. Yeah, okay. And so um, just to mention, as Tom was saying, I am uh, in the Department of Entomology at UW-Madison, but I'm also the director of the CDC-funded Midwest Center of Excellence for Vector-Borne Disease, which we um, received in 2017. So we're coming up now on our last year of this five-year cycle, and we've been able to do a lot of really wonderful things related to both mosquitoes and control of mosquitoes in relation to things like West Nile virus, but also to ticks and tick-borne disease, which is um, probably our, a much more significant issue for human health in Wisconsin and, and through the upper Midwest. So what I wanna talk about today, I, I broke this talk down into three um, general areas. I'm gonna talk first just about ticks and some aspects of tick biology. And then I'm going to talk about the reason we care about ticks, and that is because of their um, involvement in transmission of diseases. And then I'm going to end, if I have time, by talking a bit about some of the research we're doing to try to help reduce the risk um, associated with these diseases. So I'll just start here by um, mentioning that we have about 15 species of hard ticks in Wisconsin that have been documented here. And that often comes as a surprise to people because, you know, the vast majority of these are things that you're never going to see because they have very, very close relationships with a particular host. So as an example, we have a, a beaver tick. So unless you're a trapper, you're never going to encounter a beaver tick. Um, we also have a woodchuck tick and same thing. Once in a while, ra rarely a woodchuck tick will feed on people, very rarely. But it just, for some reason, they're not attracted to us and they don't, they, we just don't see them. Um, we do, however, have a couple of ticks that will be familiar, I'm sure, to most of the people in the room. Um, and these are a couple of ticks that do feed on people. And so we just take a second and look at this panel of images that I have uh, for you here and see if you can name them in your head, because I think that many people can, but I've been surprised over the last couple of years, we've been actually testing that hypothesis with some tools that we take out and show to members of the public. And I have been surprised at the percentage of people uh, who, who can't tell the difference between these two ticks, but probably many of you can. And what you're looking at here are the deer tick, as we like to call them in Wisconsin. On the left-hand side of the screen, there's a, a female first and then a male. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you see the wood tick, as again, we call them uh, here in Wisconsin, and a, a female first and then a male out on the outer edge. So I also will say that I might slip today and sometimes call the deer tick the black-legged tick, because if you're an entomologist, there is actually a commission that decides on what is the proper copper uh, common name for all insects and ticks in this context or honorary insects. They're not really insects, of course, they're just a relative in that group. But we have a, a panel that tells us what the, what the right common name is. And we have to use that common name in like scientific publications. And so it's been decided that the deer tick is actually the black-legged tick. So that's what I have to remember to call it when I'm talking to my colleagues. But if I say that to people in Wisconsin, they do not usually know what I'm talking about. So I'll try to remember to call it the deer tick today. Its scientific name is Ixodes scapularis, as you see. And then for the wood tick, it's Dermacenter variabilis. So I thought it might be kind of fun today just to launch things by um, uh, sharing with you a couple of fun facts about ticks. So I was thinking about some things that are really interesting to me and I came up with my list of, of a top five uh, that I'll share with you now. And I'll just, um, I'll, I'll start with a, an extra fun fact, <laughs> not one of my top five, but the image that you're seeing here is a tick that's um, exhibiting its host-seeking behavior. It's actually looking for 
something to grab onto. And so we call this questing and you'll see it in all the different stages of the ticks, but they'll get out at the tip of a piece of vegetation. Um, it could be on a, a low shrub if it's an adult or a piece of grass or another, um, you know, a forb or something sticking up. And then they'll sit out there at the tip of the vegetation with their legs raised. And they've got a couple little sensory organs right here on those front legs. And so then when they get um, movement of air or a chemical cue, they get alerted that something's in the vicinity. And then when it comes by, they actually will, if it brushes them, they'll actually be able to latch on. They don't leap out of the air. They don't jump down for trees uh, from trees onto hosts or anything like that. But you actually have to contact them for them to, um, to, to get on you. So, okay, so now let's talk about my, my fun facts. Um, and my fact number five is that some tick bites might be uh, causing people to develop allergies to red meat. So a really interesting story uh, that's developing over the last 10 years or so has been this recognition that the bite of one particular tick in, uh, uh, that you're seeing here in this image, it's called the Lone Star Tick, uh, sometimes results in that person then having a hamburger in a week or two and breaking out in hives or the symptoms have actually been as severe as anaphylactic shock where they ended up going to the emergency room. Um, well, uh, I think what we know now is that for some people, eventually this gets better, but for others, it seems like it persists for, for a fairly long period of time. So it's a definite concern. As far as I know to date, it's only been the Lone Star tick that has uh, been associated with this allergy. And luckily for us in Wisconsin, Lone Star ticks do not appear to be able to get through our really cold winters. So um, we don't seem to have established populations of this tick. Although I do every year, I get people sending me pictures, um, especially of the uh, female uh, that you see here with the white dot on the back because, and, and they will have picked them up uh, here in Wisconsin. So I think what's happening is that when the birds are migrating through, um, we're seeing some drop off of the immature stages, which then turn into the adult stages and, and people are able to detect those. But in all the places that we've looked, we've never yet seen uh, evidence of an established population in our state. So, so far, so good. Although my colleagues over in Michigan tell me that um, they now do have established populations in the southwestern part of Michigan uh, that weren't there, you know, even five years ago. So there is opportunity for them to expand uh, into our state as well. And this would be a reason to hope for a polar vortex. Okay, my fun fact number four is that uh, ticks are real life vampires. And by that, I mean, they require blood uh, for their life cycle. And what you're seeing here in this picture is an unfed female adult deer tick. And what happens to her over the course of, of uh, her feeding once she gets on one of those hosts. And so you notice that, you know, for the first four days or so, feeding is pretty slow. And then when you get out to that between four and seven days, they really start to uh, put on the weight and they'll take up to 300 times their own body weight and blood, which is just a remarkable thing to think about. It's, you, you know, you have to kind of imagine what will happen to you if in one week's time, your weight went up by a factor of 300 and what that would do to, you know, stretching your skin and all the things that you'd have to do to accommodate that much, much intake. So it's pretty, pretty amazing feat of biology that the ticks are able to do this. And again, I'll just point out here that unlike a mosquito, which is only going to feed on you for, you know, maybe three, three minutes, five minutes to get a full blood meal, and then it flies off, a tick takes quite a while to do that. So this stage, this adult stage, again, uh, needs to stay attached for about a week to get a, a complete meal. And then once they've got that complete meal, the adult female will fall off the host and she turns all of that blood into eggs. 
And what you see here is, you know, thousands and thousands of eggs, up to 3,000 have been recorded for a deer tick. Uh, and once she lays them, she dies. So she doesn't go back for a second blood meal. Um, it's pretty much a, a one-off. She takes that one big meal and, or however much she's able to get, and then she turns that into these eggs. Okay, my fun fact number three is something that not a lot of people know, and that is um, that ticks uh, secrete a kind of a cement to help them stay embedded into the host. So there are a couple things going on um, that makes them hard often to get them out. You know how people always tell you to use the tweezers or the forceps and you're supposed to pull on them gently. And half the time people tell me that never works. And when they try to do it, the head just gets left in the skin. And if you look at that picture there on the uh, right hand side of the screen with the black arrow pointing at the mouth parts, um, you can kind of see in this picture what's going on. It's not real clear, but these little um, uh, elements here are like barbs. And so it's kind of like a fish hook. They have this whole series of barbs on the side of the mouth parts. And that means that those are anchoring when you're trying to pull against them. They're helping to anchor the tick into the skin. And then the other thing that they do is a secretion of a tick cement uh, during those first few days, which hardens into like a little... Um, oh, I don't know, a little pod right under the skin. And that helps again to, to, to maintain the, the uh, feeding uh, area. The other thing to notice here is that that tick is not burrowing under the skin. Some people ask, say, say to me that ticks burrow under the skin, but the ones that feed on humans here in Wisconsin do not do that. They, they never go completely under the skin. It's always just those mouth parts that are embedded. Now, this was something I didn't know until probably 2017, actually. Um, and that is that there are some species of ticks that don't need males to reproduce. So this is kind of a, a phenomenon that we see in, in a number of different insects. It's not real common, but it's also not unknown. And we would call these parthenogenic. So these are where the females don't have to mate and they just can produce eggs as soon as they're mature. Um, and the reason that this became um, more, more widely known, I think, is because in 2017, we had a new tick show up in the United States called the longhorn tick. It first showed up in New Jersey, uh, but since then, as you see, has spread to many, many other states, including it reached Ohio last year, so it's come in our direction. I wonder how long it'll be before we start to see these in Wisconsin. And you can imagine for an invasive species, if you don't have to have a male and a female in an area, uh, it's going to be a lot easier and a lot faster for, for this particular kind of a, a life cycle to spread. Uh, one of the amazing things about these longhorn ticks, too, is just the, the sheer numbers that people are seeing. And you see the, the pair of uh, blue jeans in the image with all kinds of ticks all over it. So it's a little bit like what people in the South report uh, related to the Lone Star tick. Also, you get these little swarms of ticks like you see here. Although from the images that I've seen um, from one of my colleagues who works in Staten Island in New York, it's, it's worse <laughs> actually than, than Lone Star ticks. The abundance is absolutely amazing for these. So this is a new one that we need to worry about. Luckily though, this tick does not seem to like to feed on people. And so far in laboratory studies has not been associated with transmission of Lyme disease. And then my last fun fact for you today is that um, ticks can live a really long time. And so I contrast this again with mosquitoes. You know, I often, when I'm teaching my um, medical entomology class, I'll ask students how long they think the average mosquito can live. And an adult mosquito, you know, it's a couple weeks to a month, not very long. Whereas the ticks actually uh, can live for quite a long time. So a lot of them, if they can't find any host, can go into a kind of a resting phase. When it gets cold out also, they go into a resting phase. It's not a true hibernation. Uh, because as soon as the conditions are right, like literally instantly, uh, uh, they're ready to be active again. It, they don't have to go through any kind of internal, like um, uh, sort of returning on like some of the other insects do that go into a, a hibernation phase called diapause. 
Um, so the record for ticks is, is one tick that somebody left in a drawer and came back 17 years later. And I don't know the, the details of the story, but apparently the tick was still uh, moving after 17 years. Uh, this is a different kind of a tick. This is a soft tick, a um, couple of different groups of ticks. Our tick, the one we're going to talk about today, the deer tick, is a hard tick. And for those, the life cycle tends to be more like two to four years. So, okay, uh, with, with those fun facts, I'm going to move on now and talk a little bit more about uh, ticks and, and their role in transmitting diseases. And I thought we'd start here by just uh, discussing the life cycle a little bit because I will refer to these different stages. And the first thing I wanted to mention was that um, there are four uh, life stages, the egg, and then the eggs will hatch into these little six-legged larvae. Um, if the larvae is successful in blood feeding, it will use that energy from the blood to molt to the next stage, which is called a nymph. And you see the nymphs here. And then the nymph, similarly, if it's successful in blood feeding, will molt to become the adults. And um, the adult female takes blood. The males don't usually bl uh, blood feed very much. They might take a little bit, but that doesn't seem to be a requirement for males. Uh, other thing here for you to just focus on again is notice how small the um, nymph is in comparison with the adult female. And the nymph is actually really important in disease uh, transmission. So just like the adult uh, female, the nymphs also do have to take blood. So did larvae. And I just wanted again to kind of show you that contrast here. And this is one of the reasons why it is so difficult to uh, prevent Lyme disease transmission just by having people uh, check themselves for ticks because the tiny size means that, that they're very hard to find. So, it, you know, if you think that one's small, just imagine trying to locate this one on your person. This is, in fact, a little blood fed nymph that I found on myself about four or five days after I had been in tick habitat up in northern Wisconsin. I was in the shower. I thought that it was a little scab and then I looked at it and it was starting to wiggle its little legs. And that's somebody who works with ticks all the time and really knows to do the tick check to prevent uh, Lyme disease risk. Uh, I had done my tick check and I still didn't find the little nymph that had apparently attached to me. So they're really difficult sometimes because of that small size to detect. You can also imagine that if it's on your back, you're not going to see it and find it. If it's on your head and amongst your hair, you're unlikely to find it until it's already been on and blood feeding for quite a while. So for the most part, you know, we're incidental to this life cycle. They will feed on people, but um, it's really wildlife that are critical as sources of blood for, uh, for these ticks. And the white-tailed deer in particular is a really important host for the adult deer ticks. Um, they will feed on other things too, obviously. They'll feed on us, they'll feed on dog, our dogs, our pets, you know, our cats. Uh, as well as these other animals that you see here. Uh, but it seems to be deer that are really critical for maintaining a large population of, the, of this particular organism. Um, the deer are not important as a source of infection though. So that it's not that the ticks get infected with Lyme disease from feeding on the deer. That actually is a result of feeding in the other stages. The deer are just important as a, we'd call them an amplifying host to let the tick populations get, uh, to get up there to a point where they're important for us. Um, the larvae and the nymphs will feed on deer, but they more likely are feeding on a whole range of uh, smaller things. Um, uh, interestingly, we do a ton of work with these small mammals. So here's one of them, the white-footed mouse. Um, here's a chipmunk. We're also um, trapping voles and little squirrels and other things, shrews. Um, and we never find adults on those small mammals. The adult ticks are really restricted more to the medium size and up, uh, whereas the immature stages, you can find them on anything. 
the immatures in, uh, and what they feed on are really important for the disease transmission. So the way that the ticks get infected with the Lyme disease spirochetes, because the eggs are not infected when they're laid, is that that larval stage has to feed on a wildlife host that is infected itself with the Lyme disease spirochete. And most commonly, that is something like a, a white-footed mouse or a small shrew or a chipmunk, all can be sources of infection uh, for the ticks. And so you can imagine now that if the larval ticks, which you're seeing a whole bunch of ticks on the ear of this little white-footed mouse, um, if the larval ticks feed on a host that's infected, then they get infected. And then when that larva molts to the nymphal stage, now the nymph is out there looking for a blood meal and it's infected with the spirochete. And if that blood meal is to be on a human, then it can transmit to the, to the person. Um, similarly though, if the nymph did not get infected when it was a larva, it might feed on a white-footed mouse. And then when it molts to the adult stage, now that adult will be infected uh, again. So both the nymphs and the adult deer ticks can transmit Lyme disease. Um, and usually what we see is that whatever the infection rate is in the nymph, it's about double that in the adult. Makes sense because the adults have had two different times when they might have become infected. Um, nymphs in our area in Wisconsin, we see a wide range of infection prevalence. We've detected um, everything from about 5% of the nymphs all the way up to 24 25% of the nymphs usually uh, infected with the Lyme disease spirochete. And so about, you know, one out of every four, one out of every five. And then for the adults, it usually ranges more like that, um, 10 to anywhere like 50% of adults, depending on the year and the area. And there's a lot of variability. It doesn't seem to be particularly stable. Um, so that's the infection cycle. So I want to talk a bit about the uh, tick-borne diseases in Wisconsin. Um, and I just would start by pointing out this uh, recent reevaluation that CDC has been doing to look at Lyme disease cases in the US. And this was a report that came out a few years ago now where you know for many years the numbers that were shared with us from public health national public health were probably on the range of about 30 to 40,000 people uh, were infected now to be fair um, all they could report at that point was the cases that were being reported to them from the states because that's how it works like in wisconsin the county folks and the medical providers report to our state department uh, of health services, they vet those cases and then they share those with the Centers for Disease Control. So CDC had, you know, about 30, 30,000 cases of Lyme on their books as these reports. And then they went in and they did a couple of studies and a couple more actually quite recently where they're looking at um, diagnostics, so looking at the companies that do diagnoses uh, for, for medical providers and realizing that actually the reporting is from the state is dramatically uh, underestimated. So instead of 30,000 cases, they're estimating that it's somewhere between 300 and 400,000 cases. More recently, they've kind of reconfirmed that by looking at some insurance records, all of which suggest that we have a lot more Lyme in the U.S. than we realize. And Wisconsin's a hot spot for Lyme disease. So here's a map where uh, they put a dot uh, on the map for every single case that was reported. And you can see that the East Coast and then the, the North Central states of Minnesota and Wisconsin are definitely the hot spots for the country. I do think this is an interesting map because you kind of look at Michigan there and you're thinking, boy, why is that so different? Probably many of you have traveled to Michigan and know what it looks like. And it's just a little bit hard to understand what would be the, um, the basis for such a big difference in terms of the, the uh, case rates in the population. So uh, what I can say is that we're definitely seeing a lot of movement of ticks now into Michigan and a lot of change there uh, is anticipated in the next 10 to, to 15 years as well. 
Uh, here uh, is a map from our Wisconsin Department of Health Services that uh, looks at the cases over time. I do like to show this one because I remember when I first got to Wisconsin back in 1991 and I was hired to work on Lyme disease here. Uh, the case numbers, I would always tell my students, you know, this is about 500 cases a year in the state. And we can compare that with malaria where, you know, there'd be about 3 million deaths every year. <laughs> so there, quite, quite a difference. Um, malaria cases have come way down since that time. We've had a lot of success, you know, globally. And at the same time, we're seeing this big increase in the, in the Lyme disease cases. And in our own state, you know, from 500 to three to 4,000 now pretty regularly remembering that with the CDC numbers, that could be as much as a tenfold underestimate. So we might actually have more like 30 to 40,000 cases, which is pretty similar to what we see for some of the sexually transmitted diseases, which get a lot more attention in Wisconsin. Um, so I also wanted to share this because I think it's quite interesting to look at what's happened over time. So, you know, you just saw a, a case summary and you could see these increases in the case numbers. You also can see this big increase in the geographic area of risk. So these were summaries going from 1990 to about 2010, where you saw originally it was that northwestern part of the state where most of the cases were. And then you saw this kind of steady move from west for south and then over into the um, central and, and even a little bit into the eastern part of the state. But do take a look and notice that real distinction in the southern and the easternmost edge of our state. That's quite interesting. And it took me a long time <laughs> to understand what was going on and why the pattern looked like that. And it was only because it happens that the, um, the building that I inhabit, Russell Labs on campus, is shared with the forest and wildlife ecology departments as well as plant pathology. But the forest and wildlife ecologists at some point had this map of Wisconsin land cover uh, posted in the hallway somewhere and I just happened to see it. And then I thought, wow, that looks just like the Lyme disease map. And you can see in this more recent from 2018 map, it does line up really nicely. And the key thing is just noticing that the southern and eastern edge of the state look really different in terms of land cover. And it's largely you know, related to the amount of forest and canopy that's present in those spaces. And that really resonates with me because deer ticks, in fact, hate open, sunny landscapes. You just don't tend to find them in those places. They really need humid forest, um, a leaf litter on the ground, you know, where they can overwinter in that. And so finally, at last, you know, I felt like I understood at least this one pattern uh, of disease that we were seeing in the state. Um, but I was interested in that longer term pattern that I showed you where things have seemed to really change a lot over time since I got here in the early 1990s and thinking a bit about what are the things that are driving these shifting risks to humans? And of course, human behavior has a, a lot to do with that. So that'd be another part of this, um, of this diagram here. But I wanted to focus a bit on some of the things that specifically are relating to ticks, because I do think that that is a big part of why we're seeing these changes. So let me, let me start by setting the stage for what we think happened in relation to these ticks in the United States. And the first thing is to remember that, you know, I'm going to go back now eight to 10,000 years when we had the last major glacial period. And of course, at that time, there wouldn't have been any ticks in Wisconsin and no trees either, right? So it was post that uh, period then, we think there would have been a refuge of ticks in the Southern uh, United States. And the genetic evidence suggests that there were two invasion events. First, ticks moving from the South to that Northeastern area where the other focus of Lyme disease is and then moving from that Northeastern focus to the Midwest. And so all of the genetic evidence suggests that the deer ticks have been here for a long time, at least since 
uh, the, the um, probably seven, 8,000 years ago. And yet, you know, we have no records of deer ticks in Wisconsin until 1952. And that was a record I just found a few years ago because I was looking at the Wisconsin Insect Research Collection and found one in there that had been identified as removed from a weasel. So that's the very first record anybody ever seeing a deer tick in Wisconsin. A few years later in 1965, though, um, some forestry workers who were up in Lincoln County found something they hadn't seen before and they reported it to my predecessor, Jean DeFoliard, who was the medical entomologist uh, before I got here. And he went up and he did some, he identified those as deer ticks. And then he went up with colleagues and did some, some more uh, collections in Northern Wisconsin. And so during this five year period, they found deer ticks in all of these different counties. Notice that they did look also at a few places in Southern um, Wisconsin and didn't find them. Uh, and then after they did that, it was kind of like, okay, who cares? You know, we got a new tick. Yeah, interesting, but nobody did much after this uh, initial identification of, of some of the locations until middle 1970s and then early 1980, the recognition of Lyme disease uh, happened. So um, with that, the recognition first that it was a problem, second, that it was associated with deer ticks, and then third, that we had deer ticks here in Wisconsin, uh, our state department of health uh, initiated some work to try to figure out you know, where, where were these ticks in the state. And they did it in this interesting way, because back in that day, when you shot a deer on the first day of gun deer season, you had to take it to a registration station and, and register it. And so uh, they would set up uh, uh, partners at each of the uh, registration stations and all at all these locations that you're seeing here, who would check all the deer that would come through, or, or at least try to get to 50 deer that would come through. And um, report out how many ticks were on the deer and what proportion of the deer were infested with, with at least one deer tick. And so the very first time they ever did this was in 1981. And you know what you can see here is that in the central part of the state, there's a little bit of tick activity. There's almost nothing. There were almost no deer in the uh, eastern part of the state that had any deer ticks associated with them. It was all pretty much you know heaviest up here in that north and and western part of the state. Um, and so then when I got here in 91, I uh, was contracted with the state to do another one of these surveys in 1994. And by this time, what you could see is that central part of the state had really begun to be infested. A lot more uh, invasion had occurred. And then I ran another one. The last one of these I did was in the late 2000s. And by this Point, you could really start to see invasion uh, into the eastern part of the state. Still not as much as you're seeing over in the west, but a lot more places are showing up positive by the late 2000s. And so you could see, you know, with this continuing change in the distribution of these ticks in our state from that original uh, identification up in Lincoln County, they spread and they spread probably northwest to southwest first then central and eventually much more slowly into the eastern uh, and southern part of the state. And in fact, right now, um, uh, uh, as a result of other kinds of surveys that we do, we can say that every county, with the exception actually of Winnebago County, we, we um, identified an established population in Dodge County last year, but every single county of Wisconsin now has at least one place where there's an established population of these ticks. And so even in the places where it's mostly agricultural like uh, or urban, you know, like in uh, Madison, we will find them in the Arboretum and many of our little conservancy parks like Sandburg or Pheasant Branch or Owen, we find them in all these places where we didn't, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. So they've invaded our state entirely. And now, um, 
well, thinking back, right, we've seen this big change in the last 50, 60 years, but we know those ticks have been in our area since post-glacial period. So what, why are we seeing so much change right now, just within the last uh, uh, time period? And so there are really three things I think that have gone on that have led to the patterns that we've seen. And the first one has to do with big changes in our landscape. So one thing to look at here is this map of virgin forest in the United States. And it kind of tracks the period from 1620 um, through 1850 and then up to 1926. And look at the big difference between 1850, all this area was all virgin forest to by 1926, almost all of it was gone. So there were massive uh, logging operations, uh, as I'm sure many of you are aware, throughout much of the Eastern United States. And I already said, deer ticks really require forests. They like those moist, humid conditions. So a lot of good habitat was probably destroyed by the early part of the 1900s. And concurrently with that, there were big changes with wildlife. And so we've talked about how important deer are to support the uh, amplification of a deer tick population by feeding the adult females. And here, what you're seeing is some uh, data from the USDA that looks at what happens with the whitetail deer population. So right around 1900, they just about went extinct. Look at how low the population estimates were for that time. So about the time in Wisconsin, when there were was very little forest left, there were also not very many deer left. One of the things I've read that's very interesting about this is that the deer were being uh, hunted, commercially hunted to feed the loggers and they were also being shipped down to the Chicago meat market. Um, so you saw these big changes in important wildlife and in the, the um, uh, habitat. Uh, okay, and then the last thing that's important is that we have been seeing some changes in the temperature in particular. And this is just a, um, some record of March temperatures, for example, from 1900 to about 2010. And you can see that it's not a lot of warming, right? But it is a bit warmer. So say from 26 and a half up to around 30 as this average temperature uh, in the month of March. So that's a small change, but Deer ticks are um, uh, ectotherms, so they're cold-blooded. So temperature, as it does for every other insect, has a really strong impact on their uh, biology and reproductive success. And so probably these small changes in temperature uh, are having some impact on the population density, how many ticks there are out there. Um, we also know that changing temperature is having an impact on their uh, geographic range. In particular, uh, temperature is responsible for recent expansions that we're seeing into Canada, where it just used to be too cold, but now they're, they're able to survive the winters in parts of Canada. Uh, we do expect, too, that as things get warmer, we're going to see a longer tick season with things starting earlier. So now tick season in Wisconsin usually starts in mid-April with the adults. Uh, and goes until about mid-October and then, but we expect that we'll start to see adults a little bit earlier, a couple of weeks, and as well as the immature stages also being out there looking for food a little bit earlier and longer. And then last, I'll just say, uh, people don't often think about this, but temperature does have uh, impacts on the wildlife host too. We've been doing some work to think about how the little mice that are so important in this life cycle might be affected as things are getting warmer. And we're definitely seeing uh, white-footed mice moving into Northern Wisconsin where they didn't used to be present. And so that is going to have an impact as well. So to summarize then, um, probably the reasons for the big changes we've seen over the last 50, 70 years now have to do with these big trends in the landscape, the wildlife population, and the temperature, as well as the, the figure in the background here shows, you know, more people moving into areas where forests are regenerating and being in closer proximity to the, those wildlife habitats. <coughs> 
So, okay, so with that backdrop, I'm also going to uh, mention here that it's not just Lyme disease. So we often are most familiar with that one and talk about that one the most. But in Wisconsin, we now have uh, seven different pathogens that are all transmitted to humans or can be transmitted to humans by this particular tick. And you can see uh, some of them listed here in this kind of time frame in which they've emerged just in the last, you know, 10, 12 years, we've had three things we've never seen before uh, show up in our state. And as uh, Lyme has gotten, you know, the incidence has increased, we're seeing incidence increase for some of these other diseases as well. In particular, um, one called anaplasmosis. And I always like to mention this because not many people yet have heard of human anaplasmosis. But look at the case numbers, you know, we're talking five, six, seven hundred, just like Lyme disease was when I first moved here back in the early 1990s. So it is important to um, note that it's not just Lyme uh, that can cause illness. Uh, second one, human babesiosis, which is um, more like a malaria parasite, not a bacteria like Lyme and anaplasmosis. So it needs to be treated differently. You wouldn't use an antibiotic for babesiosis. That's another one that's also been increasing. So for this last bit, I want to talk about um, some of the work we're doing to prevent tick bites and disease. And Tom, if, I, uh, if I'm going too long, please don't hesitate to interrupt me at any point, I can stop. I've got a few more slides here. It's just gonna show you about some of the work uh, that the center has been doing on, on this front. You're doing great. Okay. Please. Good. So, so here's my tick team. You can see them all dressed properly for for working in a, in a field setting. They've got uh, long pants and they're light colored so the tick might show up better and they're wearing knee boots. Um, the knee boots is something that we really think is making a big difference. So we always uh, have all of our team, which is often a, a mix of graduate students and postdocs and, and a number of undergrads that we'll hire for every summer. We always have them go out to farm and fleet and buy themselves some knee boots. Cause I think that we've tested this, the ticks just do not seem to like the texture of the boot. So if you put the ticks on the boot, they'll just crawl around for a minute or less than a minute and then fall off pretty quickly. So that is one tip that not everybody uh, knows about that could be useful in helping to protect yourself if you're out hiking or working, maybe clearing brush on property. Um, in addition to those kinds of things, so there are, as you see in the figure here, there are a lot of things that public health specialists like myself and others have been telling people for many years about ways that you can just do personal prevention, including things like wearing a repellent and tucking your pants and your socks and the light colored clothing and so on. Um, as well as doing a careful tick check every night when you get in after you've been out in areas where you might contact ticks. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about personal prevention in a minute. And I'll also talk about um, prevention in the environment uh, as another set of tools that we might have. And these include uh, some uh, methods that an individual homeowner might want to use on their property, a kind of a do-it-yourself toolkit to prevent or reduce the presence of ticks on property. We've also been really interested in this idea of uh, working with whole neighborhoods for neighborhood level protection. And there um, uh, have been kind of modeling this on what happens in many states related to mosquito control. So, you know, as a result of our work through the Center of Excellence, we've gotten to know people in Michigan and Minnesota and Illinois who work on all these topics uh, really well. And it turns out that in all of those states, but not in our state, they have uh, big programs to help to suppress mosquitoes. So there's one, there are a number of them down mosquito abatement districts in the Chicago area. There's a big one in Minneapolis, St. Paul. There are several over in uh, different Grand Rapids and Saginaw in uh, Michigan. And we started thinking, well, if there are you know, investments in trying to protect people from mosquitoes, why couldn't we do more of a community-based uh, program to protect people against ticks? So we've been evaluating some of the strategies that you might use uh, in a program like that. 
And then I won't talk about it, but one clear place where people are being exposed in addition to their own backyards is when they go out and recreate and hike. And so we've been thinking a lot about what are strategies that we could use to help in those um, conditions. We're gonna be working with a number of parks on some trail mowing uh, initiatives to see how much the, that might uh, in, improve the um, uh, situation by reducing the density of ticks in those locations. So uh, in terms of personal prevention, uh, one of the things that I got involved with because of the center, which was really new for me, so out of my comfort zone, was thinking more about directly interacting with um, the public to both provide information that would be useful for them, but also to get information from what we think of as our citizen scientists about exactly you know, how they are picking up ticks and where. Um, and so we have developed this tool that's called the Tick App, which you can download on your phone. Uh, and this will be like the third year, I think, that we've uh, had this available. And there are a couple of things that are useful for the user in the app. One is that uh, we have little screens that pop up that tell you about tick activity at that particular time in your area. And we have also built into it a tool where if you find a tick, you can take a picture and send it to an expert for um, a, a 24 hour turnaround in identification as well as some advice about what you ought to do. So as an example, if you don't know the difference between a, a deer tick and a dog tick, uh, if you pick up a dog tick, you don't need to be worried about disease. Now, and we could tell you that if it's a deer tick, often we can tell you how long it might have been feeding on you and that will we can also provide some advice related to that. So we have information that we provide and in return, uh, what we ask people to do is help us learn more about what they're doing when they're picking up ticks, what kind of uh, prevention behaviors they might be using. Um, and, and they do that by filling out a daily log and then reporting any ticks that they do find. We've used this both here in Wisconsin as well as in, uh, with a colleague in New York and kind of compared the populations. And we've learned some really interesting things because we also have like a baseline survey that you have to fill out to enroll in the app. The most interesting things that uh, we've learned from this are in Wisconsin, everybody mows their own lawn. And in our New York population, everybody hires somebody else <laughs> to mow their lawn. And that might be important because maybe we need to think about targeting uh, people who are providing those lawn services in the New York area in ways that we haven't done before, like for education, for protection. And we also need to make sure that people in Wisconsin understand that you can pick up a tick when you're mowing your lawn. Um, people in the Northeast go to a lot of trouble to keep deer out of their yard. So there's fencing and all kinds of things they use to, to keep the wildlife out. People in Wisconsin very frequently are putting food out to lure the deer in, you know, because they think they're interesting to see and they want to be in closer proximity. So very different behaviors there. Uh, and third thing, people in Wisconsin trap a lot of mice. There's a lot of rodent and chipmunk removal going on here that we just didn't see in our population uh, uh, in the Northeast. So we've already learned some really interesting things uh, using the Tick app. And I'd encourage any of you, you know, if you are interested and uh, have potential for tick exposure, please think about uh, uh, using it for us this year and publicize it. You know, if you'd like to send out a, a link to in, in your networks, that would be great for us. The more people we can have enrolled, the more we can learn uh, about what's going on and, and better uh, target our, our education. Uh, another thing we've been doing related to personal prevention is uh, a recognition a couple of years ago that the kids in, in that age five to 14 uh, group that you see right here are at high risk among our population. And just serendipitously, about the same time we were talking about this, we uh, ran into somebody who was a, a head of a camp 
And they talked about how all their counselors were coming down with Lyme disease, a big percentage of them. And they're just their concern about uh, uh, campers in, in their um, situations. And we have a lot of, of kid camps. And then the kids, you know, of course, are out there at these camps at the time when ticks are really active. So we uh, started a study with a great undergraduate who's worked with me for a number of years on trying to improve camper and counselor education. And it was a simple idea. Uh, the idea was that if we got out there and trained the counselors to use these, these uh, uh, tools and then tested which was better, that maybe we could improve the kids' ability to recognize the ticks uh, and to go see the camp nurse actually to, to have them removed and documented. And so the, the, the tools that we tested were uh, showing them the pictures that CDC has of the ticks or actually making this little tool that's called a resin block that has a real tick embedded in it, several ticks embedded in it. And then um, we asked the counselors to train the kids with these tools and, and they reported that the kids were much more engaged by the resin blocks. And we think we're really um, doing preliminary analysis of this data right now, but it does seem as though more of the kids who engaged with and saw the actual ticks did detect ticks on themselves and, and uh, get to the school nurse or to the camp nurse. So we were excited about the way this project is working out. But even, you know, the best checking that you, you could do uh, is still, as I mentioned, the, the darn nymphs are so tiny. Here it is on this one of my students' tennis shoes they're just going to be hard to find. And so we need some other methods also to provide for people. So we've been working a lot on environmental tick control strategies and trying to provide the evidence that it actually, these things actually work. And we've done work to change the landscape so that it's less hospitable to ticks, to think about um, uh, insecticide treatments that we could use and also um, some work on targeting the reservoir, the host animals, particularly the, the small mice. Um, we've uh, worked with about 90 households in a couple of neighborhoods in Eau Claire and up around Mirror Lake for this trial of how could you treat your uh, yard with an, a caricide or an insecticide to help protect you in your own backyard from exposure. So these houses were all selected because they abutted woods. So, you know, you would need that. You wouldn't just choose a house that didn't have any woods around it at all. And then we used a product uh, that we thought that homeowners could apply themselves uh, at the right dose. And then we used it only as a barrier treatment. So we put it down for about a meter or so uh, up against that edge with the wood. So that ecotone area is where we tend to find the most ticks. And every one of these houses had at least one nymphal tick before we did the treatment. Afterward, all the treated houses, um, it was like 95% suppression. So it worked really well. Um, we learned some very interesting things actually though in working with these neighbors and in neighborhoods. And one was that we did find uh, nymphal ticks in places we did not expect to find them. So they are definitely the most abundant up here in this kind of an edgy area. But we use this thing called a finger drag that you see down here, this white cloth and pull it over the vegetation. We also found them out in this bright, sunny, grassy area I, that I never would have looked there for a deer tick. It just seems too hot, uh, but we found one there. I don't know how long they will live there, but it definitely made it into that area somehow. We also found one in this landscaped uh, kind of mulched area up near the house. So even if you totally killed all the ticks that were in this ecotone area, still, you know, the odd one could be introduced into other places that you might frequent in your yard. So it just says to me, hey, you gotta stay vigilant when you've been outside in these kind of areas. Okay, and then the last thing I'm just gonna mention briefly is that I'm also fascinated by the idea that you might be able to do something in relation to um, tick control by targeting the animal host. So we have um, some interesting projects going on right now where we're trying to develop a vaccine against the tick and against the 
Lyme disease spreader kit that we would deliver to mice through an oral bait, but, um, but that's not ready for, for release yet. We have, however, been uh, testing this other uh, methodology, which is quite interesting. And that is providing the mouse with this cotton that you see here. And the cotton has been treated with a, a caricide called permethrin. And then the cotton is loaded up in these devices that are called tick tubes. And there's a couple of different versions of these that are readily available on the market. You can go out and buy them at the Home Depot or order them up. Um, and the idea behind this, and here are some of our uh, camera trap images, is that the mice will come in and grab the cotton. And here you see down at the bottom, one's got his mouth full of cotton. And it'll take it back to the nest. It'll line the nest with it. And then every time it goes into the nest, it gets a little treatment of the permethrin on the fur. And it's kind of like putting front line on your dog, right? Uh, any ticks then that try to attach to that mouse aren't going to make it. And so the tick tube idea is, um, I really like it because you don't have to spray a lot of uh, pesticide into the environment. It's very targeted to the specific host and relative to other things that people have tried for reducing ticks in the environment, it's pretty inexpensive. It's not as inexpensive as using the granular insecticide, but, but because of the targeting, it's still not bad. And we've done some studies to see what people would pay to reduce their risk. Most people, $100 is about as much. And, and for this, you know, 25 bucks to treat uh, about an eighth of an acre of mouse habitat is not too bad, I think, of a price. So we wanted to test it because some of the prior studies have been all over the place and how well it actually works. And we set up a big study um, at the Arboretum here and we were we actually combined it with a look at some landscape management too, where we were removing the buckthorn. Uh, so we either removed the buckthorn, we put the tick tubes out, or we did both. And what we could see is that when we put the tick tubes out, we really had a big impact, at least a 50% reduction in the density of those um, nymphal ticks. And so I think it's a it's a strategy that deserves to be part of an integrated, you know, using it in an integrated program could be really effective. Okay, and so with that, then I'm just going to end by um, short sharing this slide, which again uh, reminds me to point out that a lot of the work that we're doing is is based on a wonderful team of uh, postdoctoral associates and graduate students and undergraduates who get out there every year and collect a lot of ticks throughout Wisconsin and actually implement these studies. Uh, and that we try to keep uh, updated information about what's going on at our website. And you can see the link there at the bottom. And so with that, I'll end. And hopefully, according to Tom, we can now have some uh, questions. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, B is, and Paul are going to help field the questions because I have to peel off and do a recording with PBS Wisconsin. Um, thank you very much for that talk. That was fascinating, cool stuff. And it's amazing what you've been able to do over the last 30 years with um, ticks in Wisconsin. Um, is there any, Kathleen Ott has one right off the bat. Um, why don't I read that one and then Bea and Paul can field the questions. How many diseases uh, can infect dogs or how many ticks even? Good idea. I mean, good question. Well, so dogs can get Lyme disease for sure. Um, and dogs can also get anaplasma. As far as I know, um, they do not get the Babesia. So Babesiosis is um, a mouse uh, pathogen, Babesia microti. And for some reason, mice can get it and we can get it, but other, not so much across other uh, kinds of animals. Um, I'm not sure about Powassan virus. That's a good question. And I'm not aware of any um, studies that have shown like the Ehrlichia, for example, this particular species of Ehrlichia also seems to be restricted to, to the um, mice and to, to humans um, or other small mammals and, and humans. Um, in terms of the kinds of ticks, you know, on dogs, we see 
Big study scapularis for sure. We also see the derma center, the American dog tick. There's another tick that's really tightly associated with dogs called Ripocephalus, but in Wisconsin, we just do not see that one. I think I only have two records in 100 years uh, of ever seeing Ripocephalus here. It is something that you see a lot more in the hotter parts of the US. Awesome. And then I think Kathleen Ott had a question earlier um, in the talk asking, and she asked, any theories on why Michigan has so many fewer cases? Yeah, isn't that interesting? Well, you did see kind of the march across Wisconsin, the slow march that we've seen over the 70 years. And so I do think that what's happening in Michigan is probably tightly related to what's happening here. And we were like the epicenter, you know, ticks really got started here and they've moved slowly in that direction. And my colleague there at MSU who does the same kind of work that I do there, she's been mapping the, the movement and has seen pretty dramatic changes over just the last five years in Michigan as well. So I think that we're just kind of on the leading edge of the invasion into that state. And we're likely to see some big increases in um, disease risk to that population as well. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to uh, speak out to Susan? Or I can just keep her. Actually, I have a question. Is, is there anything at all positive about ticks? Oh gosh, Karen. <laughs> People ask me that about mosquitoes too. <laughs> You know, I, I think it's a really interesting question, but as a biologist, um, I just always feel like there's so many things that we don't know yet. I mean, I definitely know that ticks are carrying a lot of other things that aren't making people sick, but that might be getting into like wildlife populations, maybe the mice, for example, and helping to regulate those. So regulating vermin, you know, regulating rodent populations might be a part of why uh, or how ticks might be valuable to the ecological systems. Um, I don't know if anybody's actually shown that, but some of our work has been looking at other like viruses and things that are unknown, uh, but that we can detect in the ticks. And we found at least seven or eight virus, in indication of seven or eight viruses that so far as we know, don't make people sick, but they're out there floating around and, and what they do is, is unclear. And that reminds me of a study I saw, a report I saw just a few years ago where somebody said they had seen a, a, a white-footed mouse population just plummet. It's clearly a disease epidemic. No idea what the, what the pathogen actually was in that case. Thank you. Good question. Um, back to the chat, Marianne, I don't know if you want to clarify this question a little more. I'll read it out. Um, she asked gaiters and, or other suggestions to wear with hiking boots slash shoes that don't come knee high. I don't know if she's asking what kind of shoes to wear to help protect yourself. Or, or wearing gaiters or something. Yeah. I mean, I do think that that's um, that tucking the pants into the socks and then treating with repellent if you don't want to wear like a knee boot or something is, is another useful strategy. Um, we were thinking recently that we would try more like ankle boots instead of knee high boots and see if we could find some. But the ones that we looked at so far that had uh, more of a cloth kind of base, base to them did not work as well as those, whatever they're, those, uh, farm and fleet boots are that are real rubbery like I'm not sure what the material is but um, if they're that kind of texture that might help uh, but you know the ticks can get on your legs down by your ankles but also a little bit higher up which is again I think another reason why those knee boots work so well uh, to prevent prevent them from crawling on up I would also recommend you know if you do need protection to think about the using the permethrin treated clothing. That too is something we demand for all of our field team. That seems to work really well. Um, you can buy clothes that are already treated with permethrin. They're kind of expensive. So usually what we do is we go to Walmart, we buy um, the liquid, and then I will go to like St. Vincent de Paul and buy some used clothes for my field clothes. 
I get a sunny day. I take the perm the permethrin. I spray all my clothing, get them treated. As soon as they dry, then they're safe to wear. And usually that permethrin will last through about six washes. So I think that helps a lot because then when it's like putting the permethrin on the mice, you know, when they walk on your clothes, they get a little bit of a dose of it and it's enough to kill them before they can attach to you for long enough to transmit the Lyme disease. So I've never had Lyme. I've been out in some of the worst places in the state, you know, for the last 20 years. So 30 years almost. Yeah. How oh, good to know. Um, another question is what is the likelihood of contracting Lyme disease from a tick bite? That's a good question. You know, like I said, if you're bitten by an adult tick, um, we think probably 40 to 50, 30 to 50 percent of them will have the pathogen. And so just if, you know, if it was 100 percent successful, then you probably got a one out of two or one out of three chance. Right. Um, it's not 100 percent successful. There are people who are bitten by infected ticks who don't seem to get infected. Uh, and that may be something about their immune system or priming or, some, you know, I'm not sure exactly what it is that. Uh, leads to that protection could have been a prior exposure that they don't know about that uh, gives them some antibodies already. Um, but so it won't be, you know, won't be as high as one uh, as 50% or 30%. It'd be something a little bit less than that, but that's what it would be for an adult bite <laughs> if it goes all the way to completion. Um, for a nymphal tick, it's going to be more in that one out of every four, one out of every five. Recommendation is if the ticks have been on you long enough, so say 24 hours or so, long enough to begin to transmit the spirochetes, that you should probably go see your doctor and get some prophylactic treatment. Go ahead and get them to give you the antibiotics. That's what I do, actually. If it's been on me long enough, then I do want to make sure that I don't get Lyme disease. So does anybody else have any questions they want to ask? I have a question. I'm sorry. I have a question about um, transmission. Um, my sister and, and brother-in-law have had Lyme uh, multiple times, and they swear they've never had a tick on uh, more than 24 hours because uh, they live out in the woody area and, and are in, out in the woods a lot. Um, and they do t tick checks every night then. Um, but uh, is there any study, any evidence that um, transmission can occur in less than 24 hours then? Yeah, that's a great question. There was a study uh, a couple years ago that reported, this was from an animal model, that if you had more than one tick on you, so if you had two on the animal, that the transmission time went down to 12 hours. Actually, they were seeing some of the animals becoming infected in a shorter period of time than they were with single ticks, you know, per animal. So it could be something like that. If they're out there in areas where there are plenty of ticks and they're picking up maybe a nymph and an adult, um, you, you can you can see some reduced timing to infection in that case. Uh, one other question related to my sister and brother-in-law is they have a lot of bird feeders and they they have noticed a lot of mice in their garage or around the garage um, and, and so other rodents would be attracted to the um, seed you know the the waste seed underneath the feeders um, with the the tick tubes that you described um, would that possibly be a a way to reduce the risk from those rodents that are mm. attracted to that seed, mm. the waste seed? Yeah, maybe. I think it might be, yes, because those mice, um, then one would imagine that any ticks that attach to them would die, so they're not mm -hmm. going to be dropping off and then turning into nymphs, you know, right around that area. Um, and when we tested this in the ARB, we did, we trapped mice, and it was really remarkable, uh, the reductions we saw in the ticks on those mice, the number of ticks on mice and the number of mice that had any ticks on them at all, you know, it was dramatically reduced when we put the tubes out. So I think it might be something to consider. Thank you, I'll, I'll recommend that to them. A question on that chart that you showed, what was buckthorn, what, what was the? So, yeah, so we were trying in the Arboretum two things. We were looking at whether um, removal of an invasive plant, the buckthorn, 
that has been associated with um, denser tick populations uh, could be combined with the permethrin to get more bang for your buck. We were hoping we get an additive effect, so an even better reduction when we did both things. And that didn't happen. We didn't see that additive effect. The interesting thing about that project was that um, we took the buckthorn out and it was so invaded that it was just a dramatic shift in the landscape. You know, we moved it all and it went from this really dense packed area to real kind of open with nice tree canopy and all that, but not much else. It was just all buckthorn. And the next year, um, saw a huge reduction in the number of nymphs in the plots where we'd taken out the buckthorn. And then the year after that, when we removed any stump sprouts, we kept, you know, keeping it, keeping it down, but it wasn't the same kind of radical change that we had made that first year. We stopped seeing much impact of buckthorn removal. It was only in the first year right after we did it. That was when we really saw the big decrease. Whereas with the tick tubes, so I should also say, uh, because I didn't make this clear, what the expectation is with the tick tubes is that any larvae that are feeding on them won't succeed, right? And so they will not turn into the nymphs, which would be feeding yeah. the next year. So there's always a one year delay with the tick tubes in, the, in how they affect the nymphal populations. And with that, we did see every year after the first year we deployed them, every year after we saw about this 30 to 50% decrease in the nymphs that were on the, the property, so. All right, and then back to the chat for a question. What do ticks eat besides blood? Good question. Um, well, nothing. Mosquitoes do, of course. Mosquitoes eat uh, nectar, plant nectar and sometimes uh, fermenting fruit, but ticks do not. They're entirely blood feeders. So they have to have like um, some symbionts to help them because blood is missing in some critical nutrients that are provided by these bacterial symbionts. <clears throat> and then um, Diane put a longer, a longer question in the chat. Diane, do you wanna um, tell your story and ask your question, or would you rather have me read it? I can read it. Uh, so I grew up in northern Minnesota on a farm in a state forest. My dad was also a logger, and as a family during the summer, we helped with logging, peeling pulp and balsam um, when we weren't in school. And the deer were prevalent in that area that we lived in. We picked up regular ticks all the time and so did our dogs, but we never ever found a deer tick. We wore long sleeve and pants when we were logging or haying. Uh, were we just lucky or are deer ticks just more prevalent than they were 50 plus years ago? I think, you're, I think the latter is correct. I think that they are much more prevalent than they were 50 years ago. Um, we have into Minnesota seen the same kind of expansion that we're reporting that I'm, I was showing you today for Wisconsin, um, where you know originally they were pretty hard to see uh, to find in the northern part of the state, but now and whenever the the um, the team from the Minnesota team goes out and looks, uh, they're finding them in a lot of places where they they were not established, you know, just ten or fifteen years ago. So uh, it's not a static situation, and I always. You know, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that still many healthcare providers um, think of this as something as when you go up to your cavern in northern Wisconsin, that's when you're at risk. Uh, you couldn't possibly get, in fact, somebody came to me not that long ago and said their doctor said you couldn't have Lyme because you haven't been out of Dane County. It's not a problem in Dane County. That is just so out of date, right? Like that's 20, that's 20 years ago. You know, almost all of the woodlands and the places, even here in Madison, you know, not to mention when you get outside of Madison um, and, and start looking at the at the parks out there, all of the places pretty much um, that we've looked have at least a low population now. So um, it's not static and it's going to continue to change. Thank you. I have a question about co-infection. Uh, it's true that you can be infected with both 
uh, Lyme and like ehrlichiosis is uh, ticks can be infected mm -hmm. yes. with both and you oh, can yes. get transmitted with both, correct? Yes, thank so your, you. your, your, yes. your provider has to be aware that you can have more than one disease. Indeed, indeed. Actually, I thank you for bringing that up. That's something that I and a couple of students of mine who are in the public health program at UW Medicine have been working on over the last couple of years. And we're just about ready to publish some papers on that. But we are we can now report on what the rate of co-infection for say Babesia and Lyme or Anaplasma and Lyme in one tick looks like. And it's not very high, but it's not nothing either. You know, we're seeing for Babesia and Lyme Lyme, it's about six to seven percent of the ticks, and it's uh, probably roughly that same um, range for the anaplasma and Lyme. And every once in a while, we'll get a tick that'll have like four different pathogens in it. So it's definitely possible if you're unlucky, you know, that you could be infected with more than one thing through a single tick bite, or of course, you could have multiple ticks on you at the same time if you're in a tick area and again, get infected with multiple things. And as I said, you know, if you're, if it's anaplasma and uh, uh, Lyme, the antibiotics are gonna work on both of those. So that's probably not as worrying as the Babesia because you do have different treatment for that. So you have to know uh, that you have this potential for co-infection. Um, so another one of my students has been working with Wisconsin DHS to look at the records, the reports, to get a sense of how frequently we're seeing co-infections, you know, detected and what the relationship with the health outcomes for those patients uh, look like. And there is some indication in that work that it that the outcomes are more serious, that hospitalization uh, is more likely if you have both a Babesia and a, a Lyme disease infection. So thanks for asking that question. Yeah, great questions. Does anybody else have anything they wanna ask Susan here? If not, thank you all so much for coming and for, for the awesome questions. And thank you, Susan, for the great talk and answering all these, all these questions. Yes, thank you, Susan, it was very informative. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, B. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you next week. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs>